Hey, all you holistic hipsters out there, it's that time. So grab your chalice of choice and sit back and sip along with us. We would love to welcome you to the Tea Podcast, where we spill the tea on all things holistic in the pet grooming industry. Let me introduce you to our hostesses with the mostesses. She is the socialite of skin and coat care, Ms. Michelle Knowles. And the queen bee of all things oily, Ms. Melissa Conti Diener. Brought to you by TheOilyGroomer.com. Are you searching for a new and more mindful way of grooming? Interested in understanding how to grow your grooming business with a more holistic and organic approach? Please contact Melissa Conti Diener at TheOilyGroomer.com so that you can set up a meeting and bring balance and prosperity to your life. And AllThingsPaw.com. Intermediate and advanced courses in pet esthetician work, fear recovery, animal handling, and more. Get your learn on with all things paw. And by PositiveEd.com. Attend from anywhere in the world. Always pay the lowest price. Six to ten hours of innovative content and more. Education for every learning lifestyle. Never miss the class you need. And transcripts are provided for recordings. Say hello to Pet Professional Education Unleashed with PositiveEd.com. Now, let's get this tea party started. All right. Hello, Melissa. Good morning, Michelle. And welcome, everyone, to the Tea Podcast, where we talk about stuff in the grooming industry. <laughs> stuff. All sorts of stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. What do you got in your cup today? Well, let me introduce you to one of my favorite tea cups. See that little Ooh, sunshine? I do. And on this side that I get to smile when I see this cup. Smile. <laughs> Ernie mm-hmm. and rubber ducky. And inside it even says rise and shine rubber ducky. Oh, so that's adorable. This is one of my favorites. It's uh, 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 reminds me that I am Ernie and not Bert in any situation. <laughs> Bert's usually kind of grumpy and mad about everything. I try and be be Ernie. So, I'm totally the Ernie in our marriage. Yeah. <laughs> I have um, uh, uh, tangerine. Mm-hmm. And hibiscus this morning with a little, uh, I threw a little bit of uh, lemon balm in there too. Ooh, nice, nice. This so morning. that's my rise and shine. So a little citrusy. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Very what's, tasty. What's in your cup this morning? So I have lizard people. <laughs> Shout out to Hecklefish of the Y Files. You can find them on YouTube. They don't endorse us, but I endorse them. Oh, well, them? there you go. That's very Ernie of you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Lizard people by Hecklefish. Yes, yes. So today I have a, a formulation I call Clear Heart, and it has ginkgo biloba, ashwagandha, hawthorn, and cinnamon and orange peel. And that is for clarity of mind, uh, supportive of the nervous system, and good for your heart. Nice. Love That's what I'm about today. Ginkgo, biloba, and ashwagandha, and they're so fun to say. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Got, I'm putting in our banner. Oh, put our banner up. What's our topic today? What's the tea today? It is. Let's see. Tell us. Fur, fur, there we go. fur and other magic. <laughs> yes, we're so indeed. fancy. We can do some stuff. So yeah, this is this is very fancy, very 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 fancy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so lead us off. Uh, well, topically, we were going to shoot for uh, talking about how using 
herbs on hair and fur, which uh, which is another hot topic, which is, is it, do, do dogs have hair or fur? Mm-hmm. And um, do specific breeds have hair or fur? Uh, our good friend, uh, Jennifer Bishop Jenkins, has pretty much coined that with the mm-hmm. hair and fur separation. And then mm-hmm. uh, we are going to just discuss uh, a little magic with using those herbs for whether you are using it on hair or fur. And mm-hmm. how it can be a magical elixir to help with skin and coat and regrowth and even um shine and uh mm-hmm. brightening colors up or lightening or darkening mm-hmm. uh, so all the all the good tea on tea rinses and we'll oh, talk I like it about, we'll talk a little bit also about hair and fur and and how uh different coat types will um uh respond to uh tea rinses topically Obviously, uh, different coats are going to absorb and uh, and be able to absorb in a different in a different way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, the the hair and fur issue was brought up, and I think that that is very important to distinguish between the different coat types when you're working with them in a salon and you're trying to get that best texture. Um, once you get down to therapeutics. Um, hair and fur become the same. It's all hair. It's all fur. It's all uh, keratinized cells, basically, that grow right. directly from the skin. So, um, I, But I do think that it is important to differentiate between hair and fur simply because when you are working with them, combing them, brushing them, washing them, and trying to get them to have the texture that you want, it is very important to differentiate between those. Uh, you're not going to do the same thing on a Maltese coat that you would on a wire. Uh, they're just two different types of coat. Um, uh, and they require two different types of care. They do. Absolutely. Different formulations, different products across the board. But when you're working with something like a tea rinse, you can use the same tea rinse on a Maltese as you could a wire coat. Uh, say you have a wire fox terrier and you have a Maltese, which your wire fox terrier is primarily white. Mm-hmm. Your Maltese is white. <laughs> it should Hopefully. be white. <laughs> yeah, it should be white if it's correct. I've been given those dogs and been like, you know, this is my rare black Maltese. and Or the rare like, black Maltese with a black stripe or a white uh, stripe. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, okay, this is rare, <laughs> but um, you can use the same kind of tea rinse. Uh, you can use a chamomile that will lighten and brighten uh, mm-hmm. the white, the, that white coat. Um, and uh, it'll also uh, soften. And um, so it can be used to uh, take a little, obviously you don't want to take the the harshness out of that wire coat, but Mm -hmm. it will give it um, a lift. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Like lighten that Mm -hmm. up so that it does get a, it doesn't look as heavy. An an uh, subtle boost to the eye. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. A subtle boost to the eye. So, Mm -hmm. um, so with, with tea rinses, you can go across the board utilizing Mm -hmm. on, um, on the same, utilizing the same tea rinse on different breeds or uh, mm-hmm. different coat types. Um, mm-hmm. with the, I th- the yeah, I think it's interesting. It depends yeah. on. I think it's interesting that um, tea is not utilized more in the, in the salon environment or in the grooming industry because it's it can do easy. so many things, right? It's yeah. water and herbs uh, and you can use them for, bacterial infections, fungal infections, uh, not just to support the hair, but to support the body too. Uh, dandelion tea is so nutritive. Nettle tea yep. is very Nettle. nutritive. And all those can go on cats and dogs. Burdock is for everyone. And that's very nutritive. Well, and uh, that's, so, 
that's pretty much across the board. You, when you're using T's, you can use those on both feline and canine. There is mm -hmm. very, very few that you can't use on a cat. Right. Because it's not, it's not, um, it's not volatile like an essential oil would be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's very gentle. Herbals are yeah. very, very gentle. Uh, yes. Yeah. And oil, essential oils are very volatile, but they're very concentrated. Exactly. Uh, so they're the same thing, except you use them in completely different ways. The proportions of the carrier oil or water are different uh, when you're using something so concentrated. But they have the same pathway to the brain, to the nervous system, to the cells. Uh, which is why I think herbs and essential oils uh, can be married together very lovely in a very lovely way. Oh, absolutely. Now, I know as an aromatherapist that it only takes seconds when you apply essential oils topically to cross through the skin and then go into the actual bloodstream and then cross over the blood brain barrier. Hmm. which you know, is because your brain blocks out a lot of that. It has a natural mechanism in place to not let things t get to your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, but essential oils are one of the things that actually can cross through that blood brain barrier. And which is why you have to be very careful when you careful. use them folks. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I'm saying that it is, it is a, a definitely a, um, a volatile medicinal Mm -hmm. therapeutic to use um whereas when we just use the the herb instead of the the um, essential oil we're looking at a, such a, a more gentle way mm -hmm. for the body to uh, ingest those you know through the skin um mm -hmm. to ingest all the the healing properties of of an herb or a blend of herbs in a tea right Exactly. And a lot of people don't realize that you could use tea instead of just plain water in every circumstance. So let's say you're yep. going to do a clay mask. Instead of moistening your powdered cosmetic clay with water, make a tea. If you're treating an infection, why not do a calendula tea or an echinacea tea uh, into the clay, which you mix, and then use that uh, for your clay mask. Uh, if you're blending your conditioning uh, materials, your ingredients, like let's say you want to use conditioner and some collagen and some minerals, but then you want, it's a thick coated dog. So you need to dilute it down. Use tea, use a really weak tea instead of just plain water. And then you have the benefits of that herb. There's a, a million different ways that you can use herbs or essential oils in your practice that it's so beneficial, so nutritive, so healing. I just tend to look at my, look at my appointment book for that day. And what am I, ha you know, what do I have coming in? What kind of coats? Um, what's, what's on the books? And then I'll formulate according to what, what I have coming in. So I might make up a couple of different teas. Um, I, I prime, I only groom littles at this point. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, I have a beautiful red, uh, Shih Tzu that I do that comes in uh, to see me at my home studio. I do a nice Rubio's tea rinse and oh my gosh, that makes her coat so nice and red. Like it feeds that red color. Mm -hmm. um, so does the hibiscus. Now mm -hmm. I've also done a hibiscus on my white Shih Tzu and it does give her a pink hue, which mm -hmm. you know pink is my favorite color. Mm -hmm. um, but hibiscus is really, really nice, um, is excellent for their blood pressure, for blood flow. Hibiscus mm -hmm. is a good one um, for lymph. Um, so uh, just be aware that if your tea is a, has a color, a dark color, and you're using it on a light colored animal, it's going to pick up that hue, especially uh, um uh, dependent upon how long you allow that to steep and how mm -hmm. strong you make that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a light tea, a uh, very uh, diluted tea is really what you're looking for when you're doing 
topical therapeutics anyway. Um, especially if you make sure you do a conditioning mask beforehand, that kind of fills up the hair shaft itself with water and, and other things so that by the time you put your tea into the conditioner, um, it's not really going to stain your dog uh, because the hair is completely full and it's mixed into the conditioner. Uh, however, um, you can play around with a lot of different herbs if you want to enhance the coat color. She is right. very, very right about that. St. John's wort, especially, it has, comes a, a really nice purpley burgundy uh, type of rinse for those coats that have red in them and you want to accentuate the red. That's an amazing, amazing tea. And it calms the dog and it calms you, it calms it's everybody. A, it's a, it's a, exactly. That's a nice zen calm everybody mm -hmm. down tea. So. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. And it's just so simple to make. I mean, you're basically mm -hmm. just boiling the water, adding the herbs in a steeper. Usually, you know, you mm -hmm. can just use the yeah, if you if you have if you want to use it in the salon, you can get for those of you who can see the video, this is my, one of my um, French presses, and this is how I make my teas because I drink it throughout the day. Uh, so this is something that you can have at your um, salon or wherever you are. Uh, if you're in a home situation or a mobile situation, um, you could possibly make it per dog because uh, it's that simple to make. It just takes a couple of minutes for your hot pot to warm up the water. Uh, and then you pour it over the tea, let it steep for a minute or so, and you got you have your treatment. So it's always really good. Yeah, just make sure so. you let it cool down. Absolutely. But what a great selling point. What a great, you know, if you're already a holistic groomer and you're mm -hmm. already touting your holistic uh, therapeutics or just your holistic services, you know, uh, some some groomers will fall more on the spa side than they will on the, you know, deep therapeutic side, but why mm -hmm. not just advertise you? We do beautiful, um, calming chamomile tea rinse with every, every pet or mm -hmm. you know, something so simple and so inexpensive. Absolutely. You could also do cold infusions. Let's mm -hmm. say that you don't want to work with uh, a boiling water or cold whatever. Water, right. You could throw cold water right over that. If, if it's distilled, it's even better. So there's no impurities in it. Uh, but you could use regular tap water because you're just going to use it that day and toss out the rest or just use all of it on the particular dog you're using it for. Just throw in your herb or herb mixture, your formulation, put in cold water and let it just sit there for about five minutes. Uh, and it, you will get a nice weak tea uh, to be able to do all your ablutions with, and it will be amazing. Yeah, you can use the the, the tea steepers. You can also use mm -hmm. just muslin mm -hmm. uh, that you can just wrap your own or cotton cloth. You want something that's going is not going to leach color. Mm -hmm. So um, you want to try to stick with like cheesecloth or something like that. And exactly. And, uh, and then just pop it in there. I make, sa I will make sachets mm -hmm. and I will, uh, make, make small sachets, tie them up with uh, jute. Uh, mm -hmm. and then I do soaks. So mm -hmm. I'll do tea soaks and I use the little, the little dish pans, you know, those tubs, the smaller tubs that you mm -hmm. get at, at the dollar store. And I'll put the warm water in there, put my pet in there and then pop those in there and then wet them down and let them kind of soak in there. And everything is self-contained in, in that little uh, sachet. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm done with that, because I don't throw anything away, <laughs> <laughs> because I have a small problem, um, I'm always like, oh, is this really trash? Can't this be reused for something? Um, you can take those herbs and then I like to sprinkle them on my plants, like on the, mm -hmm. you know, um, make a little compost with that stuff the end of the mm -hmm. day. Um, and, and it's wonderful. It's just going right back into the things that I'm going to use because I use whole herbs and I use dried herbs. And so it just depends, but, um, it's just such a simple thing and mm -hmm. it just sounds fancy. It does. <laughs> it does. And it really is, if you think about it, because yeah. everything, if you're doing things therapeutically and mindfully and holistically, uh, you're being very mindful about each and every uh, formula you choose, every ingredient that you choose for that particular dog, or just in general for use in your salon or in your environment. Um, 
and all of those things are very important. Uh, they are fancy, if you will, because yeah. a lot of people don't realize how therapeutic they really are. Uh, and especially in today's age uh, of people who are becoming more and more mindful, people who are going for spa treatments, more men than ever get manicures and facials uh, and oh, things yeah. of that nature. And they want that for their pets too, men and women alike. Uh, so I, I feel like th this is something that you could offer that's not expensive. It takes yeah. a little bit of time, but you absolutely could incorporate that into the cost of the groom or offer it as an add-on service. Uh, it can easily be put into your salon today. You oh, can just yeah. go out and get regular tea bags. And you don't have to have some fancy organic, specially bulk ordered from, you know, Zanzibar. You don't have to do that. Just go to your grocery store. Although I would love to go to Zanzibar. Order from Zanzibar. <laughs> Girl, me and you. <laughs> In but, the spice market. Yes. Yes, we would be at home. Uh, <laughs> but you don't have to do that. Let's say you want to start, but you don't know where to start. Where? Cam chamomile and rosemary are probably the best ones to start. Uh, uh, don't say lavender simply because lavender is very common. Everybody uses it, even though it's a lovely herb. Chamomile for calming, rosemary for shine. Uh, those are the two things that you could start with just out of the store. Just go get chamomile, and, go get rose. Yeah. And I have to, I have to... I interject and throw in that one of the biggest things that we hear constantly is when you get the dog from the owner or the cat even um and they complain about them being itchy right so any of the mints are mm -hmm. great for uh for itchy dry skin um they also are wonderful for uh contact dermatitis or bug mm -hmm. bites mosquito bites and so is lemon. Now, yeah. in a tea, this works much differently than uh, citrus in an essential oil, where you should not be using essential oils uh, with the citrus, um, any kind of citrus notes um, around felines. However, right. if you're going to make a tea, it's very different. And so you can utilize a weak tea on feline like a mint like a peppermint or spearmint or even just regular mint or mm -hmm. a lemon um lime you can use those um and make it nice and weak it's it's like when i another podcast that we're, we'll mm -hmm. be doing when we talk about pet aromatherapy i talk about hydrosols which right. are the the, the basic weaker cousin to the, the gentle, the gentle yeah. solution. <laughs> so tea is definitely a gentle solution for felines, especially. Mm -hmm. So, and if you want to let it sit, you can let it sit. It, it could sit for a while and then you can do a nice little light, cool rinse afterwards to just take it out. You can also um, uh, pre-make like, if you're going to do lavender or you're going to do chamomile or, or rosemary, or you're going to do chamomile rosemary together. Um, you can make a batch and put it in a, you know, in a gallon container for that day and use that as you rinse. And then just, you could even it. use that for the next two days, two or three well, days. Yeah, I'd say the third good. day is the last day a tea is usable and you just throw it away. If you've got a right. big pitcher that you can put in your refrigerator, if you have a refrigerator in your facility, right. it, you're good to go. You just have to make oh. it every third day. Right. So, I mean, it is just so cost effective. It's most of the time they do have an aroma. It's not mm -hmm. a heavy aroma, but they mm -hmm. do have an aroma. It smells nice. I love the fact that it almost always gives a, a, a almost like a crispness to the coat mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. the actual haircut. Even though if you're going to do a, a, a mask like Michelle uh, recommended to do a conditioning mask beforehand um, to, to fill that cuticle with the conditioner, mm -hmm. um, that's up to you. Um, I sometimes will add a little glycerin mm -hmm. to my tea. And then when I do my tea rinse, the glycerin is in there. So that is a, a little boost of conditioning as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and it feeds. It's it's sugar based basically. So yeah. it does. It feeds the skin. Right. So um, and we know that 
sugar nourishes. It mm-hmm. is a um, uh, hydrator. Sugar. Yes. Mm-hmm. So um, when you add things like uh, glycerin or honey, you can add a little mm-hmm. bit of honey. Um, obviously, it does not- help pull and retain uh, moisture right. into the skin. Yeah. So um, there are a lot of different things that you can do that way that are very inexpensive, very good for skin and coat. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't have to have a PhD to be mixing and making this stuff. You really don't. Um, anybody can do this. You have yeah. a little bit of background, get a little bit of history, learn about it. There are courses available. Um, I myself am going to be offering uh, a topical derm course in herbal care or herbal care uh, topically for pets uh, here in probably the next couple of months. Uh, so you you can. Uh, Melissa offers a, a comprehensive aromatherapy course and how to use essential oils around animals. So she has that, I believe, right now. Uh, she has that. Yeah, I have I have that, and I have um, I have the book, which uh, fingers crossed I will have by the end of this month or the beginning of September. That that will be mm-hmm. out. That will be an actual recipe, mm-hmm. kind of manual that will allow you to understand how to use teas and oils and um, just all the things Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I always talk about and how simple it really is to create these, um, these uh, therapies. And, Mm -hmm. um, and it's not anything that's going to break the bank. Right. Yeah. There's nothing so expensive. I mean, we pay, so much money for our tools, so much money for some of these products that we get, you know, adding tea is like nothing. It's like nothing, you know, $10 box of tea and some water. It's just crazy. And all the benefits that you get from that, especially if you can put it on. You can utilize that for so long, especially if you're making weak tea. So you're not making a heavy, strong, so you can use a small amount of herbs and do a gallon and use that gallon. Yeah, I'd say you could probably use either a a fourth, an eighth to a fourth of a cup to a gallon uh, is the perfect uh, uh, concentration of tea uh, to be used topically. That's fantastic. And for all those who want to skip a step and just steep your tea and then pour all the whole concoction on the dog and you're going to rinse the pieces of tea away. um, Number one, good luck with that if it's a thick coat. And number two, (laughs) and number two, you have to understand you're putting the herb itself directly onto the hair or the fur. And that is, you have run a greater risk of um, color coming off of the herb onto the hair and staining it. So I don't recommend just pouring the herbs directly onto a coat, especially if it's a light coat. If it's a black coat, go for it if that's what you want to do. But if it's a lighter coat or a combination color coat, um, you're going to stain up the lighter portions of that coat. So just uh, keep that in mind when you're working. If if they want to actually utilize the herbs in a in a topical way where they're not contained in like a sachet or in the tea Mm -hmm. itself. And then you, Mm -hmm. you steep it and take it out. Mm -hmm. I would suggest a scrub creating a scrub. I make big, Mm -hmm. big glass Mm -hmm. jar fulls with scrubs with uh, Himalayan pink salt. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll use the Hawaiian black salt in there and I'll mix all my herbs in there and my oils, or I'll pour my hydrosols in there. Um, and um, shift to the other way, I'll use uh, raw turbinado sugar to make mm-hmm. a polish mm-hmm. with the herbs and everything mixed in there. Um, mm-hmm. I'll even use uh, powdered milk mm-hmm. for soothing. Um, so if you want to make those kind of things, you can, and you can add the herbs directly in with that mm-hmm. because you're going to be using it in that friction kind of way, creating either a polish for the skin and coat or a scrub, which is exfoliate. They're both going to exfoliate, but one is really going to super hydrate and the other one is mm-hmm. going to pull oils from, mm-hmm. um, but also deposit mineral. So, um, you know, and again, very inexpensive, very simple to use. But understand that when you do those things, make sure that you have a good straining system on your drains because mm-hmm. all those 
beautiful little herbs are going to go right down in there and they're going to get and caught up. everything and okay. they'll be attached to the hairballs that are in there and everything else yes. and, and whatever else is you're trying to smash down your dream <laughs> right so make sure i have the little screen strainers and mm -hmm. so when i rinse everything goes on that and then i just take that that i won't reuse in my plants or anywhere that i just pop right into the garbage can because it's got the mm -hmm. dead hair and dead skin and mm -hmm. all that but um yeah you can make a scrub or a polish and um i think on my youtube channel if you go to my youtube channel the oily groomer i think i have a couple of videos of me mm -hmm. working with when i used to uh be able to groom the larger breeds um mm -hmm. doing a few different polishes or scrubs but and i those are great because it's so simple to just and always you always want to try to contain everything in glass if, if you can mm -hmm. um, dark dark glass yes dark glass and um but you can make a nice big batch of uh whatever that scrub is and then just have your little scoop and you just take out what you need and that's good for quite a while mm -hmm. i mean i have some that have lasted me six eight months um mm -hmm. if they're in that jar and i just didn't utilize them quick enough and um but they can also be used in that same way as a soap you can take that salt with those mm -hmm. herbs put that in a sachet and drop those in the in the uh buckets or the um the little tubs that you're uh you're doing a nice soak especially mm -hmm. for those frito feet puppies right you have those stinky feet a, an amazing one is like a citrus with some rosemary um to really kill off that bacteria mm -hmm. yeah so i agree with that i agree with that also and i'm glad you brought this up too people don't realize that minerals are very easy to come by if you have himalayan pink salt um, a tiny little pinch of that, like a fingernail full thrown into some kind of a rinse, you're actually giving a mineral treatment. Yeah. That's a mineral treatment. Uh, and we are all and you need depleted. to advertise that. You need to say that you offer yeah. a mineral treatment. Yeah. You should have that on your add-on uh, yeah. services. Uh, because we are all deficient and depleted of our minerals. And one of the big ones is magnesium. You hear a lot about magnesium soaks and magnesium this and magnesium that. You could take magnesium chloride flake and put a couple of flakes into the water with your herbs. And now you have an herbal uh, mineral infusion that you're using to treat this animal with. You know, if they've got yeasty feet, that's all good. Um, Western medicine uh, concentrates on getting rid of the symptom. Uh, and I believe that traditional Chinese medicine believes in balance. Uh, and I think that both are important. Uh, we need to build a bridge between the two. Um, not only do we want the pet to be more comfortable, but we want to do it in such a way that it's not quick, that it supports the body system. Uh, it's not just getting rid of bacteria is what I'm saying. Um, right. The absence of bacteria does not a healthy skin make. Healthy skin has to have also oils, minerals, vitamins, um, all the ingredients to make more skin or to do its function. Magnesium is responsible for over 400 uh, mechanisms in the body. And those are the ones we, can, we know about. Uh, so just like it takes a, um, a bridge of sulfur to be able to, for copper to bring amino acids to the cells, Everything, all the structures in your body, all the connections in your body, everything is working. It's a huge factory with millions and billions and trillions of workers in your body, transporting waste material, transporting nutrients, uh, this, that, and the other. Magnesium has to be had for everyone. Strangely enough, the more you stress out, the more your cortisol will kill off or use up your magnesium. So if a dog is stressed, the best thing you can do is throw a little magnesium flake, just one or two little teeny little trace mineral flakes into some rinse water, uh, uh, into a cup, uh, maybe with some herbal tea like calendula or echinacea or chamomile. And you can just put the foot down into this water and you're just infusing that huge sebaceous gland that's in those uh, paw pads with magnesium, with 
nutrition, with oils. That's where they absorb the best is through those sebaceous zones. So put it on their belly, put it on their feet. You know, put they would love the, that. You can always uh, do a little rub on the, um, the ear leather. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So you could put you could put magnesium flake in oil, let yeah. it dissolve and use that to clean out the ears, clean out yeah. uh, wrinkles and, and folds in the face uh, for Sharpe and other dogs like that. Bloodhounds, they've got wrinkles everywhere. Clean those wrinkles with oil and you will do them a huge service. Yeah, I think it's a misnomer that we actually have people that want to utilize all these alcohol-based products because they think that it's going to kill off anything bad mm. like again i always have an issue with pouring anything down an ear unless it is mandated by the veterinarian mm. and they're under veterinarian's care and they want that ear canal flushed out i don't believe that we should be flushing an ear canal i believe that we should be using a gentle like a tea on a nice cotton pad and wiping out that ear and just nourishing that skin as much as we can clean in the corners of the eyes with those the same thing with that same type of tea to just clean out that area clean up and then a few drops of a mineral enriched oil to mm -hmm. just come back in and just nourish that again in in my personal opinion is so much better than a commercially produced alcohol based product with colors and mm -hmm. fragrance oils and all this stuff that most of us as groomers were taught to just squeeze right. in that ear canal mm -hmm. and indiscriminately just, right. uh, people people freak out when i tell them uh if an ear looks pink and doesn't have any dirt in it i don't even touch it i don't wipe yeah. it out at all why fix something that isn't broken, broken and, exactly. and again it goes back to that same adage uh, we don't want to just take away all the bacteria and fungus from the ear there are bacteria and fungus that live on us that live in harmony and perform a function they break down all the oils and this that and the other on the skin they're important for us um so if we just kill them all off like oh he's got ear infection let's kill everything in there and dry it out well you have to understand that the entire ear canal is lined in actual skin. What does skin need? Minerals and oil to be healthy. So if you are using an alcohol-based cleanser, uh, and I don't have anything wrong with alcohol. I'm not mad at alcohol. Just the absence of bacteria does not a healthy ear make. Right. So you can That's kill my issue. Yeah, you can kill the bacteria, but if you're not replenishing it. So let's say you have uh, an alcohol-based Ear cleaner fine absolutely go ahead and use it it's keratolytic it'll break down all that waxiness but when you're all done just put a layer of mineral oil not mineral oil that's the wrong thing to say because people think i mean petroleum products which i do not when no. i say mineral oil i mean avocado or argon or camellia with a little bit of uh, pink himalayan salt in it that's to me is a mineral oil not petroleum based mineral oil who's that's clear and doesn't really have any nutrition but after you're done with that alcohol, make sure you oil that ear back up again, right. give it some nutrition, uh, and then you will be doing right by that ear. Well, if you an ear to you should if there isn't any of that discharge, if there is, if you look at that ear and it's a beautiful, clean ear, it looks healthy, nice and pink, mm -hmm. and it that has no odor coming from it, none of that. It's like a nice, healthy ear. Nice, Don't healthy touch ear. it. Right. <laughs> Even alone, I mean, at the most, what I usually will do is take the towel when they're still wet you know, from washing them and then just take the, as I dry that ear off, depending if it's a flop ear or, you know, you mm -hmm, have to pick mm -hmm. up that ear or if it's a prick ear, you know, where you can actually see in mm -hmm. um, and just take that towel and just kind of dry up any residual water that might mm -hmm. be left behind from the back. Well, you could use like a cotton ball or a cosmetic round or right. whatever it is that you have or you're comfortable using. Just but take off the dampness. To, you don't have to put a product in there. Correct. It's Correct. not necessary. That's why I'm always like, I, I try to stay away from the heavy alcohol products mm -hmm. just because I especially on a healthy ear or yeah, um, yeah. You know, on healthy skin. You're, you don't you're, want to disrupt the mantle. Yeah, you're uh, taking away that, that homeostasis. Yeah, yeah. 
And I, I want to clarify, too, the reason that nothing should be dumped in the ear, and there's one reason alone, but it's a big one. Let's say the tympanic membrane itself is torn or ruptured somehow. When you put force of liquid into the ear, squirting anything in, and there's any debris in there, all that gets shoved into the inner ear. The funny thing about the tympanic membrane is, is that it heals really quickly. So let's say you're cleaning that ear and you're squirting stuff in there and something has happened. The dog can scratch his ear or something has fallen in there, ruptured the membrane for some whatever reason. Debris gets pushed into the middle ear and then the tympanic membrane heals with that debris inside. We have now just created a chronic ear that more than likely will have to have surgically, it will have to be surgically closed at some point in the dog's life. So just willy nilly dumping stuff down in the ear is just not a good idea. And for me, it's because we cannot be assured. I don't have an otoscope. Uh, I don't know uh, if anybody else carries an otoscope in their salon. I'm not trying to look inside anything because I work topically uh, for my safety and theirs. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's the compromised uh, tympanic membrane that scares me when people pour stuff in the ear. Now, as far as powder, when you put powder in an ear, the ear is a self-cleaning mechanism. So it's constantly trying to push and exude. That's why it gets waxy. It, it's waxy to capture any debris. And then it gets pushed out of the ear by shaking and just by regular um, exudation of the ear itself. Uh, and that's where all that stuff comes from. And we're forcing a powder into the ear for whatever reason. Well, that powder accumulates over time right at the tympanic membrane. And then it solidifies like cement. Um, I've had veterinarians, several veterinarians, show me uh, this cement-like powder uh, at, because the dog is basically deaf because it's all blocked up against that tympanic membrane. It can't vibrate at all. So the dog's literally deaf. Uh, and they can relieve that pressure by taking out that calcified ear powder. Uh, so I, I urge everybody who uses powder for any reason around the ear, puff it on your table and either dip your instruments in it to get the powder effect, the residue, the, the gripping action, or dip your fingers in it. That way, uh, the least amount of powder goes into the ear and you have less of a chance of it building up near uh, the base of the ear, which is shaped like a big L. Uh, and that's why I have an issue with dumping stuff in the ear. Uh, I know that ears can get really disgusting and goopy and chronic. Um, and there are ways to treat those, I think, herbally. Uh, however, that's another show another <laughs> talk, another <laughs> thing. Topic, yeah. yeah. Uh, back in the day, we used to just take the water and flush those ears out because oh, that, was, yeah. that was the only thing that we could do for those dogs. Cause the, at that time the owners wouldn't take them to the vet or the vet had just given them some goopy medicine that the parents didn't want to put up, put in there. And they just threw their hands up and be like, well, I guess he has a bad ear now. Uh, and that's the only relief those dogs had at that time. Uh, I know better now and I do better now. Uh, that's not the correct way to treat that. Um, there are all different ways uh, to encourage your clients to take their dog for vetting. <laughs> well, so. and I, I think we also need to know for those of us that work with felines is that the, the, the feline anatomy is a little different than the yes. canine anatomy in the ear, in that inner ear. And they mm -hmm. actually have a little shelf, a bone and a little turn that when we put fluids down in that ear those fluids are retained in that area which can throw off their equilibrium which can oh, cause yeah. um uh, uh ear infections back more bacteria to grow because we're introducing a liquid down into that ear canal mm -hmm. um, and they're unable to shake it loose and you might see them trying to scratch and hit it and so they actually have a little bit of a different um, shape of that inner ear. They have all the same bones and, you know, the tympanic membrane, the, what are they? The hammer, the anvil, the cochlea, uh -huh. um, they have all of those pieces in there, but the actual layout of, you know, mm -hmm. the map is they, they have this little shelf that comes off that L shape and it's kind of up higher. And that is where all that liquid collects. Mm -hmm. 
So we want to make sure that we are not squirting anything down into that ear for that reason as well. And just think about it. The ear is a self-cleaning mechanism. It is made it is. to get all that gunk up and out so that you can use a cotton swab or a, a, a cotton ball or pad or whatever to just wipe that away in that immediate opening mm -hmm. of the pin A, which is that ear. Yes. And, and be able to clean that out without cleaning down inside the body. So we are, as pet groomers and even as holistic pet groomers, we, by law, and, and I would have to make a guesstimation but i would say every state the let's say the, ma boards, the majority of the states right. <laughs> yeah. the veterinary boards do not want you doing anything internally to that pet correct like we and that, work on and the that, outside and that means under the gum line yes uh you can get in trouble for for cleaning teeth yes. under the gum line even if, if there's no anesthesia or anything yep. like that uh, because that's considered internal, which stymies me a little bit because they'll it, tell they'll tell everybody, oh well, your groomer should be expressing anal glands. Right. Hold on. Aren't anal glands or inside the, the body? Aren't our anal glands inside the body? Just yeah. they're inside. Yeah. I'm not yeah. shampooing the anal glands. <laughs> I have a problem with ear hair because I feel like if it's not right there where I can just readily pluck you know, yes. fuck out what's right there. Mm -hmm. And it's that big, giant, huge mass Stunk. up there. Yeah, that's down in that ear canal. Mm -hmm. They need to go to the vet for that. That's not and the my reason. Opinion. Yeah, the reason they need to go to the vet and the reason that we don't do it is number one, it is inside the ear, inside right. the body. Uh, and number two, when you pluck that heavily, uh, you have to have that debris um, flushed out and then yep. the ear has to be medicated. And that's why they have, actually have a special machine that irrigates ears, believe it or not. Uh, and it's at the vet. Uh, and there's nothing that the groomer can do. Now, I'm not saying that groomers, because I know we're going to get blowback from that. You already know. Well, I've done it all the time. I can do it. I've been taught how to do it. Fine. Right. Fine. If you've been trained how to do that, excellent. Fine. I'm not saying that groomers are incapable. I think groomers are capable of like surgery if they have to push comes to shove because we're tough like that. I'm not con uh, condoning. So in the zombie apocalypse. Right. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I'd be right there too. <laughs> right. You got to do what you got to do. I understand it. Right. However, uh, we're closer than ever to some kind of regulation across the nation. If, even right. if it's state by state, we need to really mind our P's and Q's. I don't want to yeah. step on veterinarians' toes. No. I would. I want. I love veterinarians. I, I love their diagnostics. I love that they're our partners. However, if we just start do a stay and we can do everything and start doing everything, well, there's a lot of other body systems that are attached to that ear. Yes. Or those anal glands that can go wrong and it affects other systems. And we're not trying to do that. We've not been no. for veterinarian school. And we actually took a class, you and I, together. It mm -hmm. was many moons ago. But, many. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know. But it was a, a veterinary specialist who literally only did ears, eyes, nose, throat. And then it was also, wasn't it the derm vet as well? Yes. Uh -huh. And they both were adamant that that should not be ripped out with like a, a hemostat, a hemostat like, yeah. how we swirl it, twirl, twirl it and rip that right out. Mm. And they explained that that can cause even more chronic issue because what we're doing is we're damaging that delicate tissue that's way down in that ear canal mm -hmm. and, and just leaving it open open right and to bacteria is, grossness yeah yep all of that and so um they were talking about how they see chronic ear issues that can come from that as well because we're pulling that out and then not replacing with anything to heal that wound essentially that we're creating. Yes. Yes. Um, and so um, I think we just need to be cognizant of that fact that when we do that and believe me, I learned on poodles and standard mm -hmm. poodles and, um, and I was cockers. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, and I mean, I was taught to take that locking hemostat and get that sucker and twist it around my finger and twirl and the dog would just scream and cry. And you're like, I know, I know it's going to be over in a minute. And then take that and rip that stuff right out. Mm Mm-hmm. And that was just part of it, but we were never taught to put anything else in there Mm -hmm. to do anything like that. And so. Well, let's think about it for a moment. Let's take a step back and think about this procedure. Yes. We want air to get into the air canal. So it can all be healthy and this and the other. However, you don't want the ear canal to be completely stripped of every hair that's in there because it, it performs a function. Exactly. It's It's supposed to. Yes, it catches all that debris before it can get next to the tympanic membrane. So we we should start really being mindful of how we do our techniques, how we do our procedures. Right. What exactly are we doing and how are we affecting other systems by the techniques that we're using? I think that's really important. Yeah, I, I believe that I believe that everything has a purpose. And so there the universe, God, whatever you want to say, when it creates a creation, there's a purpose for it. Everything Mm -hmm. has a purpose. So that dog has that ear hair there for a reason. It is a filter, but just like everything else in nature, sometimes some things go a little overboard on things. Well, I mean, we've we've genetically manipulated dogs in such a way that they can't fulfill their own functions most of the time. Pekingese, I mean, let's name them out. Pekingese bulldogs can't even reproduce by themselves. They need uh, assistance in reproducing. So, I mean, if you think about that, yeah, sure. We've made them into all sorts of things. But I think going back to their basic biology and their basic biological needs, according to code type, that's probably the best thing we can do for their health overall. Yeah. And I think we have to start really looking at them as more than just hair or fur. Definitely. Um, My hashtag, more than a haircut. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's, uh, it is just the thing that drives me is that I love to do a beautiful haircut. I love to do something where I stand back and I go, oh, crap that is damn good girl that's an instagram worthy picture right, right. Well, when i get some of those i'm always like oh i'm sharing that but that's not my main goal my main goal is to make sure that they are happy and healthy and um mm-hmm. stress free in that time and i've done everything i can in that hour and a half or two hours or however long they're with me to help nourish them body mind spirit so mm-hmm. I'm trying to take care of that body in the best way that I can with product choices and general handling choices, all those things um, with with their, uh, not opinion, but from their point of view, you know what I mean? Right. Like how are yeah. they, how are they going to feel about this? And I've said this before, I got roasted in a, in a, a groomer's group about feeling like I need to make sure that when I work with an animal, I'm getting consent. I'm going to give them time to consent. And I've said this before. I took Ashley Hamby's class. uh, Don't pull the beard or don't hold the beard. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I mean, Mm -hmm. brilliant. And shows you literally how you can clean up these faces by holding in different ways without grabbing that beard and scruffing their faces. And, mm-hmm. and it is a consent. You have to step away, give them a minute to get them, collect themselves, go back and they will give in. They will give in and say, okay, I'll let you you know do this mm-hmm. or that. But I think when we really start to look at, it's not magic, it is choices. And it is a um, a heartfelt thought of wanting to have a connection mm-hmm. with that sentient being that is underneath that hair or fur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you if you, if you remember than- that you're working on someone's best friend, right. uh, and and now I have the opportunity to make them my best friend as well. You know, I'm not going to give up on them. I'm going to treat them with just as much respect as I would give my very best friend. You know, uh, I want to spoil them and make them feel comfortable and happy and healthy. And when they when they walk out the door, I want them to feel 
comforted. And when they walk in, I want them to be, be happy to be there. Yeah. Well, all right, we're coming up on an hour. Um, we're going. Is there anything else you want to add to uh, add to the conversation, Miss Melissa? I don't know. Uh, I just I just feel like if you are trying to create that kind of connection with the animals that you're working with, you also will be nurturing yourself, body, mind, and spirit. Oh, yeah. You're not working in that assembly line fashion. You mm -hmm. are actually considering from that point of view. That was the word yes. I was like. <laughs> this is what happens when you. This is what happens when you get old. Um, it was <laughs> rattling around in this brain. So, but when you actually consider that animal's point of view and start to take a step back and think about things, it's it's good for the groomer too. It's good yes. for us to consider, you know how they actually may feel about this and actually try to think about how they, uh, why they are acting the way they are acting. Yeah. I'll never forget someone who asked me because I said, you know, we probably shouldn't be doing the anal glands. Um, and this was early on when I was really starting to get into, okay, yeah, we really shouldn't be doing anal glands in, right. in a salon environment. Uh, so many things can go wrong and you won't be able to tell until much later in the dog's life. Uh, and then he starts having issues. But uh, somebody asked me a question and the question was, okay, fine. We don't do the anal glands. How are we supposed to stop the dog from analing on us when we do the finish? And I thought about it for a moment and I'm like, what are you doing to scare that dog so yeah. badly? He feels <laughs> like he has to anal yeah. on you on your finish. You know, how and that's we gotta never, be. We never get them completely empty anyway. You can do a, exactly. a, a, an expression in the tub or mm -hmm. on the table or wherever you do it. And then they can still gland all over you in a mm -hmm. matter of minutes. Yes. So and and what another point I wanted to bring up is uh, the glands are supposed to be full. They're, They're supposed, supposed to, to be full them on their own. Because they express them when they go to the bathroom, when they have a bowel movement. Um, the problem is that whatever food they're eating, or if they're having a lot of stress at home or something, it changes the viscosity of that anal fluid. Uh, it should be fluid. Uh, right. But when they don't eat the right things or whatever, their anal glands get what I call constipation, if you will. It gets too thick, like yeah. toothpaste or yeah. worse, like clay. Or, and that's yeah. when they get infected. Uh, so it's not just that, oh, they need to be emptied or they get infected. They're supposed to be full. They're supposed to have fluid in them at all times. That's how their body is made. Uh, it's part of their scent uh, experience when they leave a bowel movement. They leave their scent on that. And that's what dogs smell as they go through their day. And it's, um, it is an oil-based. Yes. Uh, it's, so it's a natural oil that the body makes. Right. So it's not something that needs to be expressed every groom all the time. The dog should be doing it on its own. The more you mess with anal glands, uh, it weakens the muscle uh, yep. that holds that fluid in. And we could absolutely tear and break that muscle. It also we could, takes away the muscle memory to be able yes. to do it if you yes. have it done all the time. So then the dog has to have its anal glands done because we have ruined the muscle uh, that holds it in, basically. Uh, another thing that we can do, we can actually rupture the whole anal gland and break it on the inside when we're expressing from the outside. Think of an orange with a piece of paper over it. You're trying to grab the whole orange through the piece of paper that's flat or cardboard, I should say, you know, and we can't get a hold of all of it. You can, if there's any infection in the anal gland, you can actually push that infected material back through the tube, if you will, and cause all kinds of damage, uh, all kinds of infection to happen. So there's several different reasons why we wouldn't want to do that. If you want to go to a vet and learn how to do it internally, that's on you. I would much rather have the veterinarian do that because they have a staff. They have all the medicinals, all the things they need in case something does go wrong. Right. Uh, and they have the uh, insurance and the liability um, and the education to do that. And it seems like such a small thing because, yeah, as show people and show dog groomers and this and there, we've been squeezing anal glands for since air, probably, whatever. Um, however, we used to do all kinds of mean stuff to dogs and to people, and we figured out that wasn't good, so we changed our tactics. We changed our techniques. 
uh, and we we learn more as we go along. I mean, we used to lobotomize people who were just sad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that probably we shouldn't happen. We yes. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, there's a lot of things that because I hear that off also. I hear mm-hmm. that from groomers. Oh, we've been doing it like this forever. It's just the way that we do things. It's just us. But no, you know, ears are self-cleaning mm-hmm. mechanism. You shouldn't have to mess with that unless there is some mess right around that canal. Otherwise, mm-hmm. leave it alone. You can mm-hmm. oil up that area. You can put a little nice mineralized oil to nourish that area. But you shouldn't have to do anything. Same thing with with the anal glands or anal sacs Mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. we really should not have to mess with them. And I personally have had clients that have had those glands done for that entire lifetime of that pet. And then they come back and they're like, and especially the tiny dogs, the small ones, they come back and they're like, Oh, they had to remove his anal glands. You know, he had the surgery to get them out because they were just so messed up. Because we, because the groomer had abused them for forever. <laughs> forever. And I used to have cocker show cockers, and I was a very big cocker groomer. Um, probably eighty-five percent of my business was cocker spaniels. I can't tell you how many of them had the ear canal sewed shut. Mm-hmm. That some had both, some only had one, and the years and years of us. And now, I know I, I don't look it, but I am in my late fifties <laughs> for quite a long time. We were shown, like when I was shown how to show groom those cockers, I was shown to take that sprayer and mm. just spray that ear, like get that ear and just nowadays mm. it's like cotton in there. Make sure you're not getting all that water down in there. So as we evolve in this industry, we yeah. we, we have better techniques and be, and we know better so we can do better. But exactly. it's not always a product thing. Sometimes you can create things that are just purer and more natural in the sense that they're in their 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 whole parts, like mm-hmm. making a tea or um a uh a mask or any of that and it's not a highly processed product Mm -hmm. and and which to me is much more luxurious because it's so pure you can't get that in a commercial product because it has to have preservatives it has to have uh production aids to help it flow out of the machines to fill the bottles it has to have all those extra ingredients (coughs) excuse me but if you're making something on the fly right there with fresh ingredients yeah you have like a 400 dollars treatment (laughs) right at your fingertips easy with just pure ingredients yeah and that's if you want to know more about this particular subject uh michelle has her flashcards with the therapeutics with the um kind of paint by numbers therapeutics i mean she literally lays it all out for you and there are recipes uh but i don't mention brand names because if you have the concept down uh in the way the skin processes you absolutely can follow these recipes and plug in whatever product that you want uh that follows that that template uh and then you're going to have success but they also come with little midi videos that will show you how to mix how to use that technique and what it looks like. So uh, I think it's a really good deal. And then Melissa has courses uh, developed to teach you about how to use essential oils, how to use infusions, you know, how to do all those things. So the information's out there. Absolutely. I'm always happy to help. If you shoot me an email and you're like, hey, I was thinking of doing this, and is this a good idea or I'm, I'm doing my my uh, my therapeutics and I'm using this. I'm happy to shoot you back a quick little. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea or no, I would substitute this for this. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to just try to uh, be a sounding board if you find uh, yourself confused in the maze of all that is holistic grooming. Mm-hmm. Here's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah. 
So, so don't I get guess, lost uh, in the labyrinth of So of I guess we're going to take a sip. Ah, it's that time again. Yep. Uh, we're winding down for the day. Um, Melissa, it's been lovely as usual. Oh, we'll see you. We'll see you next time because we're going to talk about tinctures, infusions, poultices. Oh my. Oh All right. Boy. So may your next sip be just as good as your last. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.